Thank you, Marcus. And it's, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been wanting to come to Bonn for a long time, and it's great, great to be able to do that. Hegel said, to him who looks on the world rationally, the world looks rationally back. More than half a century later, Nietzsche said, when you stare long into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. These paired Spiegel iron passages express in nomic aphorisms sentiments that mark the endpoints of a critical arc of 19th century philosophical thought. Hegel's sunny homily epitomizes the optimism of his version of Enlightenment rationalism that had flourished in the previous century. Nietzsche's darker remark foreshadows the pessimism of a distinctive kind of nihilism rooted in reductive materialism and naturalism, which the events of the following century would make both familiar and fitting. Each of these successive 19th century currents of thought, one looking back to what had already been understood and one pointing ahead to what had yet to be dealt with, comes with a na rationalizing narrative of progress. The first of disenchantment by reason and the second of disillusionment with reason. It was always, of course, essential to the self-understanding of the Enlightenment that it see itself as the advent of something both genuinely new and essentially progressive. It defined itself by the contrast between the light of reason that it sought, developed, and celebrated, and the darkness from which Enlightenment arose and by which it was still surrounded and would always be threatened the shadows of superstition, prejudice, and dogmatism cast by arbitrary despotic power sedimented in the merely traditional institutions with which those habits of thought connived and in the context of which they thrived. The fundamental conceptual innovation of the time was not the focus on reason by itself. Philosophy, whose avatar is Socrates, had perennially championed reason. Nor is it the mere association of reason with freedom. Know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The Christian tradition in the person of John had already taught. What's wholly new in Enlightenment philosophy, perhaps its characteristic insight, is its identification of that transformative, emancipatory power with reason in its critical function. The only authority it admits is legitimate and legitimating is the authority of the better reason. That peculiar normative force, compelling only to the rational, that had so fascinated and puzzled the ancient Greeks. And the Enlightenment acknowledges no higher judge competent to assess the merits of competing reasons than the natural light with which the capacities of each individual reasoning subject equip it. That's why Kant says, sapere aude, dare to understand. That's the motto of Enlightenment. In his essay, Identifying Enlightenment, as man's release from his self-imposed tutelage. The advent of an age in which individuals accept no authority transcending their own capacity critically to assess reasons is for Kant, speaking here for the whole Enlightenment, nothing less than humanity's coming to maturity. This emancipata emancipation, literally in Roman law, the process by which children are set free from the patria potestas, is to be affected by wholesale replacement of the traditional model of authority, which understands it exclusively in terms of the obedience owed by a subordinate to a superior, by a model that understands authority exclusively in terms of the force of impersonal reasons accessible by all. Reason for Kant can accordingly be identified with freedom in the form of autonomy. The authority of the superior in power is abolished. Authority resides only in one's own acknowledgement of reasons. All the great philosophers in the period from Descartes to Kant were theorists of enlightenment. But Hegel, I think, is the first to take the advent of modernity, for him the single most important thing that's happened in human history, as his explicit topic. Further, he's the first to appreciate it not just as an intellectual phenomenon, namely enlightenment, he was the first to conceptualize the economic, political, and social transformations as all of a piece with the intellectual ones. For Hegel, reason shows itself as having the form of a vast meta-narrative, rationally reconstructing the emergence of modernity in all its multifarious aspects.
And that narrative is progressive and triumphalist. It's the emergence of reason as sovereign, both in individual subjective self-consciousnesses and in the social institutions they shape and that shape them. It's also, and essentially, as Hegel says, the history of the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Here, two strands of the Enlightenment come together, faith in the sovereignty of reason and the narrative of the emerging self-conscious realization of that sovereignty, which is the emancipatory power of reason. Freedom takes concrete form only in the practical, including the institutional appreciation of the rational nature of genuine authority, the idea that reasons alone are normatively authoritative. This is reason's disenchantment of the subordination model of authority in favor of the model of autonomy as consisting in acting for reasons. This intoxicating identification of freedom and the authority of critical reason is the beating heart of German idealism. In it, ideas that in retrospect could be seen to have been all along implicit in Enlightenment rationalism come to fully explicit theoretical self-consciousness. It's in just such a context, Hegel thinks, that countercurrents of thought first become visible as also having been all along implicit in the same tradition. In this case, a crucial trajectory of 19th century thought expresses the revenge of Enlightenment naturalism on the Enlightenment rationalism I've been talking about. The form that revenge took is genealogy. Genealogies directly challenge the very idea of the normative force of the better reason, which lies at the core of the Enlightenment rationalist successor to the traditional subordination model of authority. The principal practitioners of the genre I'm calling genealogy were the great unmaskers of the 19th century, above all, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. And closer to our own time, we ought to add Foucault. What they unmasked were the pretensions of reason. Kant had rigorously enforced the distinction between reasons and causes, criticizing Locke for producing what he called a mere physiology of the understanding rather than a proper epistemology by running together issues of justification and causation. We must separate, Kant insisted, the quid juris, the question of right, from the quid facti, the question of fact. The first is a matter of the evidence for our beliefs, the second of their matter of factual origins. When the great genealogists dug down in the areas of discourse they addressed, they found causes underlying the reasons. Their enterprises can be rendered in relatively moderate terms. What they diagnosed were systematic distortions in the structure of communication, as Habermas puts it. For Marx, the distorting causes were economic classes. For Nietzsche, they were expressions of the will to power. For Freud, they were such things as the lingering echoes of the child's role in the family romance. On the moderate understanding of genealogy, those causal factors shape the reasoning of those subject to them, operating behind their backs, so that their own thoughts and actions cannot be transparent to them. This way of thinking about things leaves open the possibility of emancipatory critical discourses, which would make explicit those distorting causal factors, so breaking the hold they have on reasoners and moving them towards the ideal of rational self-transparency. This is Habermas's theme in his early book, Knowledge and Human Interests. I'll be concerned here, though, with a more radical challenge that genealogy can be seen to make to Enlightenment's idea of reason. For one can take it that what the genealogists dug down to is not just causes distorting our reasons, but causes masquerading as reasons. When what we fondly believe to be reasons are unmasked, all that remains is blind causal processes. Those processes have taken on the guise of reasons, but in fact yield nothing more than rationalizations. Genealogy, in its most radical form, seeks to dispel the illusion of reason. As I shall use the term, genealogical explanations concern the relations between the act or state of believing and the content that's believed. A genealogy explains the advent of a belief in the sense of a believing, an attitude, 
in terms of contingencies of its etiology, appealing exclusively to facts that are not evidence, that do not provide reasons or justifications for the truth of the content that's believed. In this sense, when it occurs to the young person that he's a Baptist because his parents and everyone they know are Baptists, and that, he's been and that had he been born into a different community, he would have with equal conviction held Muslim or Buddhist beliefs, that's a genealogical realization. And as is evident already in that mundane example, the availability of a genealogical explanation for a constellation of beliefs can have the effect of undercutting its credentials as something to which one is rationally entitled. The genealogy asserts counterfactual or subjunctive conditionals linking the possession of certain beliefs, that is, attitudes of believing, to contingent events whose occurrence does not provide evidence for the truth of what's believed. If the believer had not had a bourgeois upbringing, were not driven by ressentiment, or had not had that childhood trauma, she would not have the beliefs about the justice of labor markets, Christian ethics, or conspiracy theories that she does. None of the events upon which, as the genealogist asserts, the holding of the beliefs in question are counterfactually dependent, provide any evidence for the truth of what's believed. For the particular vocabularies they address, all of Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud offer natural histories of the advent of beliefs, believings, couched in those vocabularies, <clears throat> ones to which the rational credentials of the beliefs, what is believed, are irrelevant. Natural causal processes of belief formation are put in the place of rational ones. To him who looks on the world reductively, the world looks reductively back. This movement of thought, too, comes with its native meta-narrative of progress in understanding. Replacing theological necessity with rational necessity as the fundamental explanatory category was disenchantment of the world by reason. Replacing rational necessity with natural necessity is disillusionment with reason. From the genealogical point of view, the Enlightenment apotheosis of reason just substituted one ultimately supernatural self-delusion for another. The Enlightenment was right to be impressed by the rise of the new science, to see it as requiring a thoroughgoing transformation of our understanding of our relations to our world. But from the genealogical point of view, it was insufficiently radical. It naturalized and so disenchanted the world, but it didn't disenchant us. The Enlightenment conception of individual knowers and agents who brought about and were in turn transformed by the convulsions of modernity retains a spark of divinity in the form of the faculty of reason. The genealogical movement of thought teaches by contrast that the subjects and their relations to the objects they know about and act on no less than those objects themselves must be thoroughly naturalized. But what then about the normative force of the better reason? Is it too just an illusion arising from the play of natural forces? Or can it somehow be understood in terms of them? Can we really understand the natural science that's the source of genealogies of our believings itself entirely in naturalistic terms? Must we? In its most radical form, the genealogical thought is that if we can understand the etiology of our believings and our preferings, intendings, and so on, in terms of causes that do not provide reasons for them, then talk of reasons is shown to be out of place, not only superfluous, but actively misleading. The meta-narrative of genealogy as unmasking illusions of reason depends on the disjunction, causes or reasons, being exclusive. It's forcing a choice on us. So genealogy turns Kant's distinction back on itself. It becomes a snake, poisoning itself by biting its own tail. <clears throat> now Marx and Freud can be understood as offering local genealogies. That is, they offer genealogical analyses only of a specific range of discursive practices, the use of only some vocabularies the vocabulary of political economy, with ripples throughout the cultural superstructure to be sure, or the vocabulary one uses to explicate and make intelligible one's own motivations. Though Nietzsche's most detailed stories are of this local kind, he also points the way to the possibility of a more global genealogical lesson. <clears throat> 
that a suitably thoroughgoing reductive naturalism might undercut the rational credentials not just of some parochial region of our belief, but of the whole realm. The very idea of reason as efficacious in our lives would be called into question by globalizing the genealogical enterprise to extend it to all discourse. In this form, genealogy would be the little rift within the lute that by and by shall make the music mute and ever widening slowly silence all, as Tennyson has it. This global genealogical challenge would come to be expressed explicitly in various forms in the 20th century. But the neo-Kantian Windelband could already find it implicit in the aspirations of his 19th century historicist opponents. And it's this broader idea that I want to consider. Globalized genealogical arguments, I think, take a common form. They present causal etiologies of states and events of believing, thought of as episodes in the natural world, as rendering superfluous and irrelevant appeal to reasons that normatively entitle believers to the contents believed. The thought is that all the explanatory work can be done by causes, with no work left to be done by reasons. As a second subsidiary task, one then explains the motives for which and the structures by which believers and theorists conceal from themselves and others the underlying causal processes of belief acquisition under an obscuring veil of what then show up as mere rationalizations. All the great genealogists of the 19th century particularly relished offering such meta-genealogies. That's how they unmask our conception of ourselves as rational animals as nothing more than an illusion that puffs up and comforts animals with the sort of natural needs and interests that we have. Our need for that swaddling illusion reveals us to be in essence not, as we're pleased to think, autonomous rational animals, but merely needy, insecure, rationalizing animals. At this level of generality, the genealogical challenge to reason has the form of a naturalistic reductionism about the essentially normative force of the better reason. I think it's illuminating to compare this global challenge with a more focused version that Gilbert Harmon addresses to specifically moral normativity. He argues that the best explanation, indeed a complete explanation, of why people have the moral normative attitudes they do, why they treat some acts as morally right and others as morally wrong, need appeal only to other normative attitudes of their own and of others. It need not appeal to norms or values in the form of facts about what is actually morally right or wrong. And he contrasts this situation with that concerning our attitudes towards electrons, the best explanations of which he takes it must include reference to facts about electrons and our interactions with them. He concludes that we do not in the end have reason to believe in the existence of moral norms or values as we do for the existence of electrons. A global version of this argument, addressed to the norms of reason rather than of morality, would contend that a complete explanation for people taking or treating some claims as reasons for others need appeal only to their attitudes of taking or treating some claims as reasons for others, not to any facts about what really is a reason for what. Propositional attitudes, paradigmatically beliefs, would be treated just as features of the natural history of creatures like us, and hence is explicable entirely in terms of other such features, in this case, further attitudes. Now, I'm going to argue that there's a structural defect that afflicts global reductive genealogical stories of this kind. They depend on what I'll call semantic naivete. Semantic naivete consists in taking for granted the conceptual contents of the attitudes whose rational relations to one another one wants to dissolve genealogically. If the attitudes in question are not thought of as propositionally contentful, then the issue of rational normative relations between them, of some of them as providing good reasons entitling or committing one to others, doesn't even arise, as it doesn't for whirlpools, thunderstorms, supernovae, and other natural occurrences into whose antecedents we might inquire. The question I see is posing a counter challenge to genealogical challenges to the very idea of reason is whether and how one is to understand the contentfulness of belief, 
apart from their situation in a normative space of reasons. The overall point is that epistemological claims, including genealogical skeptical ones, have semantic presuppositions. And I'm going to argue that the soft underbelly of genealogical skepticism about reason is its implicit commitment to a naive semantics. When we look at things more closely, we'll see that the underlying issue concerns the relations between contingencies governing attitudes, what applications of concepts are taken or treated as correct according to the prevailing reasons, on the one hand, and norms to which those attitudes are subject, on the other. Observations about the former provide the basis for genealogical challenge to the intelligibility of the latter. The particular form of semantic naivete I'll identify as crucial to this debate turns out to be an assumption about the relations between semantic attitudes and semantic norms that is common both to Enlightenment rationalism and to the genealogical challenges to it. The thinker who diagnoses this shared presupposition contests it and offers a constructive alternative is Hegel, whom I will argue both anticipates and responds creatively to the genealogical currents of thought that he inspired and in many ways made possible. I've described global genealogical challenges to our understanding of ourselves as rational, both as rooted in Kant's distinction between reasons and causes and as expressing the revenge of that distinction on itself. That is, of course, a very crude formulation. And to refine it, we need to fill in some of the Kantian background. Kant, as I understand him, brought about a revolution in our understanding of the mind by recognizing the essentially normative character of the discursive. In a decisive break with the Cartesian tradition, he distinguishes judgments and intentional actions from the responses of non-discursive creatures, not ontologically by their supposed involvement with an ultimately spooky kind of mental substance, but deontologically, as things their subjects are in a distinctive way responsible for. What we believe and what we do express commitments of ours. They're exercises of a kind of authority, characteristic of discursive creatures. Responsibility, commitment, authority, these are all normative statuses. Concepts which articulate discursive acts of judging and intentional doing, Kant says, are rules. They're rules that determine what we've made ourselves responsible for, what we've committed ourselves to, what we've invested our authority in. Appreciating the rulishness of the mind is Kant's normative turn. Practically, what we're responsible for and committed to doing in investing our authority in how things are or are to be, Kant thinks, is having reasons for those commitments. What concepts are rules for doing is reasoning. It's the concepts articulating the content of our judgments and intentions that determine what count as reasons for and against thinking or acting that way, what would entitle us to do so or justify us in taking on the commitments with just those conceptual contents. As discursive creatures, we live and move and have our being in a normative space of reasons. After Descartes, the challenge was to find a place for mental stuff in a natural world of physical stuff. After Kant, the challenge became finding a place for norms in a natural world of facts. Descartes has been roundly criticized for his dualism of minds and bodies. The danger is that the result of Kant's revolutionary insight into the normativity of intentionality would be to replace that dualism with a dualism of norm and nature. Now, I take it that a distinction becomes a dualism when it's drawn in terms that make the relations between the distinguished items unintelligible. I'll argue that the collision between the possibility of global genealogies and understanding ourselves as rational depends on a set of assumptions, which I'm gathering together under the rubric of semantic naivete, that would turn Kant's distinction into a dualism. But that those assumptions are optional and indeed incorrect. And I'll argue further that Hegel, intense and insightful reader of Kant that he was, already understood all this and offered a constructive alternative 
that can provide a way forward for us in thinking about these issues today. Kant's normative turn expressed an insight in discursive pragmatics, our understanding of what we're doing in judging and acting intentionally. He also moved beyond the Cartesian tradition he inherited in seeing that its characteristic epistemological concerns raised a more fundamental semantic question. His idea here was that if we properly understand what it is for our thoughts to be representations in the sense of so much as purporting to represent something, to have objective validity in his jargon, his successor concepts to Descartes' tanquam rem, being as if of things, if we properly understood purporting to represent, the epistemological skeptical question of what reasons we could have to think that we ever correctly represent something would be revealed on semantic grounds to be ill-posed. Hegel saw, though, that as penetrating as these archeological semantic excavations were, Kant failed to appreciate and address a crucial semantic question raised by his original normative pragmatic idea. Kant correctly saw that judging and acting intentionally as exercises of authority that come with cor correlative responsibilities, commitments to having reasons for and acknowledging consequences of those undertakings. He understood concepts as functions of judgment in the sense of rules that determine what would count as a reason for applying those concepts in judgment and what the further consequences of doing so are. In a strict sense, all Kantian rational creatures can do is apply concepts in judging and acting. So those discursive activities presuppose the availability of the concepts they deploy. But that presupposition raises in turn the question faced by Kant's rationalist hero Leibniz. Where do those concepts and the contents come from? Once the discursive enterprise is up and running, new concepts can be formed downstream from applications of old, one, old ones, for instance, by Kant's judgments of reflection. But what's the origin of the concepts that make empirical and practical discursive activity possible in the first place? Hegel reads Kant as having a two-stage story. Transcendental activity is the source of the conceptual norms that then govern empirical discursive activity. The empirical self accordingly always already finds itself with a stock of determinate concepts. The transcendental processes by which discursive norms are instituted are sharply distinguished from the empirical processes in which those discursive norms are applied. In the 20th century, Rudolf Carnap provides an index example of this Kantian two-stage semantic epistemic explanatory strategy. In his version, the two stages correspond to beginning by fixing meanings and only then later fixing beliefs. The first semantic stage is selecting a language. The second epistemic stage is selecting a theory, a set of sentences couched in that language that are taken to be true. Carnap's best student, Quine, objected to Carnap that while this two-stage procedure makes perfect sense for formal or artificial languages, it makes no sense at all for natural languages. All speakers do is use their language, Kant would say, to make judgments. That use must somehow determine both what their expressions mean and what sentences they take to be true. In the vocabulary I used a minute ago to talk about Kant, the use of language to express judgments must be understood as affecting both the institution of conceptual norms and their application. Two-stage stories about the division of labor between semantics and epistemology, that is, about the relations between conceptual contents and their applications in judgment, are committed to what we could call semantic purity. This is the view that the cons contents concepts possess are not at all affected by the use of those concepts in making judgments, that is, in believing a particular subset of the universe of believables. That's the point of having a first semantogenic stage at which contents are determined, conceptual norms instituted, before a second stage comprising the application of the concepts in taking things to be thus and so, to be represented by some already contentful representings and not others. Commitment to semantic purity is commitment to the possibility of pursuing semantics independently of commitment to how things actually are. The thought is that epistemic commitments are not to contaminate semantic ones. 
semantic commitments are necessary conditions only for the expression of epistemic ones. On this picture, two essentially independent elements combine to make epistemic commitments true claims, namely semantic commitments, picking a language, instituting the concepts, and how the world is. And the second element is just irrelevant to the first. Now I think semantic purity is not an unintelligible idea. It does make sense in the context of stipulating associations of semantic interpretants with linguistic expressions for an artificial language by a theorist working in a semantically more powerful meta-language. But semantic naivete results when one believes that semantic purity is intelligible for an autonomous intentional stratum, for natural languages, or for thought in general. Quine objects to the semantic naivete of commitment to the possibility of pure semantics. And in this regard, he makes common cause with the later Wittgenstein. Both thinkers take it that all there is to confer content on our expressions is the way those expressions are used, paradigmatically in cl making claims and forming beliefs. That is, in committing ourselves to how things actually are. Two-stage theories about the division of semantic and epistemological labor for natural languages and the thoughts they express, Quine and Wittgenstein think, are bound to invoke semantic stories about the first stage that make the notion of conceptual content ultimately magical. They're committed to semantic purity. So, when applied to natural languages and thought, they're semantically naive. This is exactly Hegel's complaint about Kant. He was uncharacteristically but culpably uncritical about the source and nature of determinate conceptual contents. In this regard, Hegel is to Kant as Quine is to Carnap. And like Quine and Wittgenstein, Hegel offers an ultimately pragmatist account of how using a natural language can be intelligible as both instituting and applying conceptual norms. And this line of thought bears directly on the issue I began by considering. For global genealogical reductive explaining away of norms in favor of attitudes, remember the Harmon argument, presumes that it's intelligible for the contents of propositional attitudes to stay in place after normative reason relations among their judgeable contents are given up. Otherwise, what's being explained genealogically can no longer be understood as believings as attitudes of taking things to be or representing them as thus and so. If our attitudes were not genuinely conceptually contentful, then we would not even be purporting to represent things as being thus and so. Things would not even seem to us to be thus and so. If, delusion, if disillusionment about the reality of norms of reasoning entails semantic nihilism, then it truly is self-defeating. The genealogist's claims would entail that our own claims are senseless. The point I want to make is that taking the contents of propositional attitudes in general to be independent of the government of those attitudes by norms concerning what is genuinely a reason for what presupposes a semantically naive two-stage account of the division of semantic and epistemic labor. For it requires that the contents of propositional attitudes have already somehow been fixed in advance and independently of the rough and tumble of assessing evidence and deciding what to believe. The semantic challenge for the globalized Harmanian genealogist is accordingly to say how we're to understand the contents of the attitudes in favor of which genuine norms have been eliminated. The corresponding challenge for a one-stage account, like that of Wittgenstein or Hegel, is to explain how institution of genuine conceptual norms is compatible with the possibility of genealogical explanation of acts of applying such norms. Hegel understands this challenge and offers an intricate and sophisticated story about the relations between the institution and the application of conceptual norms, including the relations between discursive normative statuses and discursive normative attitudes that's aimed precisely at meeting that global genealogical challenge. And in the rest of this talk, I want to present the outlines of that positive story as I understand it. <coughs> One way into Hegel's constructive alternative to the semantic naivete of two-stage theories of the division of semantic and epistemic labor 
is through the conception of the determinateness of conceptual norms. What semantic purity claims conceptual contents are pure of is its contamination by the epistemic, that is, by knowledge claims, judgments as to how things actually are. The semantics of concepts or universals is supposed not to depend at all on epistemic commitments, that is, on judgments. In the paper, I have a snarky comment about Jerry Fodor as the champion in our own time of this, uh, of this view. Hegel's slogan for the conceptual sea change that he sees as necessary and sufficient for appreciating the interdependence of semantic and epistemic commitments is that we must move from understanding the conceptual in terms of static categories of Verstand to understanding it in terms of dynamic categories of Vernunft, adapting Kant's terminology to his own uses. Kantian concepts are determinate in Hegel's Verstand sense in that the rational relations of consequence and incompatibility between concepts or universals, which identify and individuate them, are taken to be fully settled in advance of any application of those universals to particulars in judgment. Kant envisaged an asymmetric structure of capacities in which a faculty of spontaneity, activity, is the source of universals which are applied to the particulars supplied by a faculty of receptivity or passivity. In developing his successor Vernunft conception, Hegel takes over from Kant his insight into the normative character of concept use and he radicalizes it by construing the relations between universals and particulars itself in normative terms of authority and responsibility. His terms are independence and dependence. Hegel takes his cue from the fact that once transposed into the normative key, the relations of authority and responsibility between universals and particulars can be understood as reciprocal and symmetric. Kant's system masks that underlying symmetry by an artificial asymmetric division of semantic and epistemic labor. Spontaneous exercises of the semantic authority of the understanding, that is of Verstand, over universals are independent of and prior to exercises of the epistemic authority of particulars, which determine the correctness of applications of universals to those particulars in judgment. This overarching asymmetric structure is a manifestation of Kant's understanding of the freedom of reason in terms of autonomy, which in Hegel's terminology is a kind of pure independence. According to Hegel's symmetric normative construal of the relations of authority and responsibility between universals and particulars, the application of one concept or universal obliges one to apply others to that particular, according to relations of rational consequence that articulate the content of the concept or universal and precludes one from being entitled to apply others to that particular, according to relations of rational incompatibility that articulate the content of that concept or universal. This is the authority of universals over particulars, the responsibility of particulars to universals. There's a corresponding relation of authority of particulars over universals. For it can happen that one applies a concept or universal to a particular and the particular does not cooperate in also exhibiting the universals that are its consequences, or in also exhibiting universals that are incompatible with the original one. This Hegel construes as the particular exercising authority over the universal, telling it, as it were, that it can't have the consequence and incompatibility relations that it originally came with. That is, that a different universal or concept is required. For Hegel, none of these reciprocal relations of authority and responsibility between universals and particulars should be understood as either purely semantic or purely epistemic. The clean division of semantic and epistemic labor is an artifact of semantically naive two-stage accounts. Our judgments shape our concepts no less than our concepts shape our judgments. Now Hegel understands determinateness, bestimmtheit, in terms of what he calls individuality, einzelheit. Individuality, in turn, is a matter of the characterization of a particular by a universal, which is something that has the form of a fact or a judgment, in the sense of a judgeable content, which, when it's true, is a fact. As Kant emphasized, concepts shape and articulate judgments. Hegel adds the idea that judgment is the process by which concepts are determined. 
The essence of Hegel's Vernunft conception is an account of the structure of the dynamic process in which the whole constellation of concepts and judgments, what Hegel calls the concept, develops by the exercise of the reciprocal authority of universals over particulars and particulars over universals. Judging the application of universals to particulars is the development of individuals, at once the semantic shaping and determining of universals and the epistemic discovery of which universals apply to particulars. Kant's pure independence model of semantic authority as untrammeled by corresponding responsibility leaves it unclear what room there remains for epistemic constraint. Why can't the boundaries, the implications and incompatibilities of the universal that's been applied simply be redrawn to accommodate any looming recalcitrance? More deeply, what for Kant would count as changing the concept of the universal? What holds fixed in advance the commitments one undertakes by applying it if its content is wholly up to the spontaneous activity of the subject? The Kantian division of semantic and epistemic labor seems unable to exclude the possibility that whatever seems right to me is right, in which case the issue of correctness doesn't get a grip, as Wittgenstein puts the point. There's nothing in the Kantian picture to confer determinate content on concepts, nor to hold them in place as determinate. What's needed, Hegel thinks, is to replace Kant's individualist model, driven by his understanding of freedom as autonomy, with a social one. What Kant tried to accomplish within the boundaries of a single knowing subject by the division of semantic and epistemic labor should rather be done by a genuinely social division of labor. Concepts for Hegel are not to be found between the ears of the individual knowers, but in the public language that they speak. As Hilary Putnam would later put the point, meanings ain't in the head. This transposition of the issue into a social linguistic key makes it clear how in judging, whose paradigm now becomes asserting, I can bind myself by norms provided by the concepts I apply to particulars. It is, for instance, wholly up to me whether I assert that the coin is copper rather than manganese, say. But it's then not up to me what else I've committed myself to by claiming that and what would entitle me to that commitment. The metallurgical experts that my community charges with the care and feeding of the concept copper will hold me responsible for having committed myself to the coins melting at 1084 degrees C and to have precluded myself from claiming that it's an electrical insulator. Whether I know about these implications is neither here nor there. They're features of the move I've made in the public language game. It's my participation in that game that permits me also to think quietly to myself that the coin is copper, a thought that inherits its shared content from claimables whose sense the community fixes. On this model, the authority of an individual speaker, what Kant construes as autonomy and Hegel as a moment of independence, is balanced by a reciprocal responsibility, a moment of dependence. And the content I've freely committed myself to and made myself responsible for is held in place as determinate by my fellow speakers, whom I've authorized to hold me responsible for it. That's their moment of independence. What I'm responsible for is what I said, not what I might later claim to have meant. What Heidegger called the dignity and spiritual greatness of German idealism is founded on Kant's reconstrual of, of self-conscious selfhood as consisting in freedom in the sense of the authority to commit oneself determinately, the capacity to bind oneself by conceptual norms, norms that are rational in the sense that they articulate what's a reason for a judgment or an action with that content. Hegel sees that self-consciousness in this normative sense is an essentially social achievement. The authority to make oneself responsible for what one thinks or for what one does makes sense only in a context in which one can be held responsible. That requires two loci of authority and responsibility. Normative statuses such as authority and responsibility and the selves that are subjects of such statuses, Hegel teaches, are instituted by reciprocal recognition. That is, by individuals practically taking or treating one another as authoritative and so responsible. Those I recognize in this normative sense of authorizing them to hold me responsible, form a recognitive community. 
In telling language, Hegel says, says that self-conscious individual selves, normative subjects, are instituted only when particular desiring organisms come to stand in recognitive relations to one another, a matter of their practical normative attitudes, and so to be characterized by the universal that is the recognitive community. Besides developing Kant's normative insight along the social dimension, Hegel develops it along a historical dimension. What binds them together is Hegel's idea that determinateness on the side of the content of conceptual norms, the topic of semantics, is intelligible in principle only in the context of a thoroughgoing reciprocity of authority and responsibility on the side of the practical force or significance of those norms, the topic of pragmatics in a suitably broad sense. His meta-concept of Vernunft is a view about the process of determining conceptual contents and about the kind of determinateness that results. This process has the normative structure distinctive of a tradition. Understanding genealogical analyses as undercutting the claims of reason, that is, the rational bindingness of conceptual norms, depends on assessing the rationality of discursive practice solely on the basis of the extent to which applications of concepts, whose contents are construed as always already fully determinate, are responsive exclusively to evidential concerns. Responsiveness of concept application to any factors that are contingent relative to the conceptual norms already in force, the phenomenon that genealogical diagnoses highlight, is accordingly identified as irrationality. But the idea that assessments of rationality are appropriately addressed only to the application of already fully determinate concepts is the product of a blinkered semantic naivete. It ignores the fact that the very same discursive practice that is from one point of view the application of conceptual norms is from another point of view the institution of those norms and the further determination of their concept, contents. Only when discursive practice is viewed whole does its rationality emerge. If the semantogenic process by which conceptual concept contents are determined and developed is ignored, the distinctive way in which reason infuses and informs discursive practice will remain invisible. For Hegel, the principal task of reason, in his preferred sense of Vernunft rather than Verstand, is, as he says, to give contingency the form of necessity. Following Kant, by necessary he means according to a rule. That is, reason's job is to put the sort of material contingencies that genealogists point to into normative shape. From Hegel's point of view then, far from undercutting reason, the possibility of genealogical explanation just underlies the, underlines the need for this particular function of reason and emphasizes the crucial job that it does. Well, how then can we understand the process whereby concepts acquire and develop their determinate content as putting contingencies of their application into normative shape. Hegel's idea is that a distinctive kind of retrospective rational reconstruction of prior applications of a concept is necessary and sufficient to exhibit those applications as conferring a definite content on the concept. This is what in the final chapter of the phenomenology he calls Erinnerung, recollection. One brings order to the motley welter that is the discursive practice one inherits by discriminating within it a privileged trajectory that's expressively progressive in the sense of making gradually explicit norms that then show up as having been all along implicit. Doing that, Hegel says, is turning a past into a history. The best model I know of rational activity that determines conceptual contents by making or finding the right kind of history for them is the jurisprudential one, institutionalized and codified in case law. In its purest paradigmatic form, it takes place in what the Anglo-American legal world called common law. For in that realm, by contrast to statute law, judges are not guided in their decisions as to whether to apply or to withhold the application of a concept, say the legal concept of strict liability, by explicit statutes propounded and given the force of law by legislatures, statutes that say what is and is not listed according to the norm they institute. 
In lieu of norms explicit as such principles, judges at common, at common law must decide cases with novel facts on the basis only of norms that they discern as implicit in the tradition of already decided cases. The governing authority to which common law judges are responsible is provided by precedent. The judge's job is not only to decide the present case, but also to provide a rationale for the decision by providing a distinctive kind of narrative justifying it as correct. Such a narrative selects some prior decisions as precedential in the sense of being not only relevant and correct, but as having revealed some hitherto hidden aspect or contour of the norm developing in the tradition defined by those precedents. The legal concepts and the principles explicating them that are given expression in rationales for deciding novel cases are often characterized as judge-made law. And this description is apt because there's nothing more to give content to this kind of law than the decisions judges have rendered and the retrospective rational reconstructions of traditions defined by precedent that the judges offer to justify those decisions. Rational, rationalizing processes of this sort both are responsible to the contents of the conceptual norms they apply and exercise authority over the development of those conceptual contents. They're processes of determining conceptual contents, both in the sense of finding out what they are, manifested in the essentially retrospective rationales judges supply for their decisions, and in the sense of making those contents what they are, manifested in the essentially prospective shifting and sharpening of the norms each new application and interpretation proposes. These hermeneutic practices give contingency the normative form of necessity. And by incorporating those contingencies, infuse determinate content into the developing norms. It's of the essence of the kind of rationality distinctive of this sort of concept determining process to be articulated by these complementary perspectives. Retrospective, determining as finding, and prospective, determining as making. Responsibility to the tradition one inherits and authority over the tradition one bequeaths. Looking backward, Along the privileged trajectory of precedents selected by the narrative rationalizing any particular decision, one sees only unbroken expressive progress. The gradual emergence into the explicit light of day of a governing norm that appears as having been all along implicit in those earlier decisions. Looking forward at how legal concepts and principles evolve by being applied in concrete cases, the discontinuities between these narratives show up as sequential judges revise their pre predecessors' judgments as to which earlier application should be treated as precedential and how. T.S. Eliot describes this aspect of Hegelian Vernunft at work in a different corner of the culture. He says, quote, what happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves which is modified by the introduction of the new, the really new, work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. For order to persist after the supervention of novelty, the whole existing order must be, if ever so slightly, altered. And so the relations, proportions, and values of each work of art toward the whole are readjusted. And this is conformity between the old and the new. Considering, considering genealogical counterfactuals about what the norms would have been had various non-evidential factors differed reveals a judicial process shot through with contingencies. As for instance, where the order in which two cases happen to be adjudicated evidently affects the content of the law that results. The normatively contingent character of any particular decision to apply or not to apply a particular concept is manifested in the fact that one always can explain any particular decision genealogically in terms of what the judge had for breakfast in the derisive slogan of jurisprudential theory. That is to explain it in terms that do not appeal to the content of the norm whose applicability is in question. To explain it instead, for instance, in terms of the intellectual fashions or public passions of the day or by features of the judge's training, temperament, or political convictions. <clears throat> 
But to conclude that the possibility of such an explanation means that no norm is thereby instituted, that the norms discerned as implicit in the tradition inherited cannot rationally justify one decision rather than another in a novel case, is to insist stubbornly and one-sidedly on occupying only one of the two perspectives that are in fact two sides of one coin, as Hegel insists and as jurisprudential practice demonstrates. It's precisely to refuse to see Vernunft whole. It's to embrace the semantic naivete that ignores the essential role rationally incorporating those contingencies plays in conferring determinate content on, determining the content of, always evolving conceptual norms. Hegel points to the, gen the generality of the lesson he wants us to learn from his Vernunft model of the practice of reason in a remarkable passage epitomized in an aphorism expressing his twist on a slogan of the day. The slogan is, no man is a hero to his valet. And Hegel adds, not however because the man is not a hero, but because the valet is a valet, a Kammerdiener. The passage continues explaining that the reason is that the valet's dealings are with the man, not as a hero, but as one who eats, drinks, and wears clothes, in general with his individual wants and fancies. Thus, for the judging consciousness, there is no action in which it could not oppose to the universal aspect of the action, the personal aspect of the individuality, and play the part of the moral valet toward the agent." End of the quote. What Hegel calls the universal aspect of the action is just its normative dimension. The hero's a hero insofar as he acts according to the norms that articulate his duty. The valet views what the hero does genealogically as resolutely naturalistic, non-normative, reduct in resolutely naturalistic, non-normative, reductive terms. And so, back to the Hegel quote, explains the action as resulting from selfish motives. Just as every action is capable of being looked at from the point of view of conformity to duty, so too it can be considered from the point of view of the particularity of the doer. If the action is accompanied by fame, then it knows this inner aspect to be a desire for fame. The inner aspect is judged to be an urge to secure his own happiness, even though this were to consist merely in an inner moral conceit, in the enjoyment of being conscious of his own superiority, and in the foretaste of a hope of future happiness. No action can escape such judgment. For duty for duty's sake, this pure purpose is an unreality. It becomes a reality in the deed of an individuality, and the action is thereby charged with the aspect of particularity." End of the quote. Here, Hegel, writing in 1806, before the advent of the great genealogical unmaskers of the dawning 19th century, acknowledges that every application of a norm is in principle liable to naturalistic genealogical explanation. It can be seen, and indeed seen correctly as far as this vision reaches, from the point of view of its particularity, its normative contingency. But that valet's eye genealogical view is one-sided. It fails to see the whole of the doing. For the valet fails to see that the norm can also be active, that the particular contingent motives he sees, what the hero had for breakfast, can be given the form of normative necessity, can be incorporated in a narrative that exhibits them as in conformity to duty, as correctly performed according to the evolving and governing norms. Hegel calls the genealogical valet's attitude Niederträchtigkeit, literally something like a striving for the low, an impulse to debate, to debase. His term for the practical attitude of giving contingency the normative form of necessity is Edelmütigkeit, magnanimity. It's a form of norm instituting recognition, the final form that he discusses in the spirit chapter of the phenomenology. Its retrospective recognitive aspect he calls forgiveness. Its prospective recognitive aspect he calls confession. What one forgives is the normative contingencies that infect prior applications of concepts. And one forgives them not wholesale by a grand gesture, but by the hard retail work of constructing an expressively progressive historical narrative in which they play precedential roles as making explicit aspects of the developing conceptual content that are now revealed as having been hitherto always 
already implicit. The slogan of this generous hermeneutic recognitive attitude is Tennyson's when he says, yet I doubt not through the ages one increasing purpose runs and the thoughts of men are widened with the process of the sons. This is what Hegel does in his own writings, first and foremost in the phenomenology, but no less in the rationally reconstructed histories that he produces for philosophy, art, and religion in his lectures. Concrete magnanimous hermeneutic forgiveness is finding such a purpose, that is a norm, to which the concept application being forgiven can be seen to contribute, widening the thoughts of man. Hegel calls this making what happens into something done. What the magnanimous interpreter confesses is the contingent inadequacy of each particular such forgiving rational reconstruction. One confesses that one is unable to find a narrative in which every contingency is given the normative status of a progressive precedential expression of the underlying developing conceptual norm. In confessing, one petitions one's successors for forgiveness of that contingent failure of one's own efforts at forgiveness. The Edelmutig rational rationalizing process in which conceptual norms are instituted by diachronic magnanimous reciprocal recognition is a structure of trust. Trust that one's trespasses will be forgiven as one forgives those who have trespassed before one. So Hegel foresaw the genealogical challenge to rational normativity that would arise from a reductive naturalism and would result in a small-minded, niederträchtig, valet's hermeneutics of suspicion. The hermeneutics of magnanimity and trust that he recommends instead is not based on fine feeling or pious sentiment. Instead, he argues that the only construal on which reason and meaning are threatened by the possibility of genealogy is a narrow one-sided conception that's mistaken because semantically naive. In its place, he puts a more capacious conception of Vernunft as comprising not only the norm-governed application of concepts, but the process and practice by which their content is determined. It is, strange as the phrase may sound to our ears, semantics with an edifying intent. At its core is the magnanimous hermeneutics that shapes genealogical contingency into a normative rational form. And my aim here has been to give a sketch in the broadest outlines of the insights that underlie Hegel's inspiring vision of the relations between the normative and the natural. Thank you.